Sometimes standing before an audience such as this tonight, it's hard to express what's coming forth from my heart. You have made it a very special day. Several of you have come up and have commented about my dad and my mom, my older brother David and my sister, older sister Sarah. I'm the middle of five. Does that tell you anything? The middle child? It is various things that you've told me about them staying with you. You heard them preach. Some of you were baptized by my dad. So it's just been a delightful day. The meal today was just awesome. I mean, I, I couldn't live here long without losing the battle that I fought for many years on weight. You know, I've already figured out this may be a three or four or five pound meeting in just four or five days. But uh, oh, I should have told you something. The more I eat, the longer I preach. Y'all may be in trouble tonight just simply because of the delicious meal and the joy it was to sit and visit and talk with several of you. May I introduce my daughter, Dawn. She's sitting with LaDawn tonight, her husband, Al. They live in Lebanon, Tennessee. It's a joy to have them here tonight. I had to pay her $20 to come and hear me. But that's all right. It was worth it, no doubt. She was walking through a mall, and she decided that she wanted some, uh, some ice cream. So, and all of a sudden, there was a Baskin Robbins right before, and she walked in and ordered a couple of uh, scoops of butter pecan. And I mean, everything looked great until she looked right beside her, and there literally was her favorite movie star. Her knees kind of buckled, and she thought, what am I going to do? He's right here beside of me. She got her ice cream, paid for it, walked out the door, realized she didn't have her ice cream. Just as she was going to go back inside to get the ice cream, he walked out and ran right straight into her, and he said, are you looking for your ice cream? She said, yes. He said, it's in your purse with your change. She forgot why she went in. We've got to make sure we do not forget why we're here. We've got to remember that indeed truth is important. And our study this morning and two lessons thus far focused in on truth versus error. We're going to continue that theme tonight and throughout the series, in fact, I mentioned this morning that for the last several weeks I've been doing a study concerning the 230 some odd times that the word truth is found in the Bible. And the various battles that have been going on since the very beginning in the Garden of Eden when Satan lied to Eve. But she fell hook, line, and sinker. She did what God had said don't do. And how tragic it is that there are still those today that are doing the same thing. God has made it extremely clear in His holy word concerning what He expects of us in order to be a child of His and how we are to live faithfully in His sight and continue unto the end. I've just got to look at the book. I've got to make that book uh, familiar in my mind, put it in my mind, keep it in my mind, ever focusing on following the signs, as it were, the road signs that ultimately lead where I want to go. I cannot, Jeremiah chapter 10 says it, verse 23, Proverbs chapter 14 and verse 12, it is not within man to direct his own steps. There's a way that seems unto man, but the end thereof is the ways of death. I may pull myself up and kind of button my coat and think I've got it all figured out. I know exactly what I need to do. I know what will make me happy. I know what will get me to heaven. But you see, I don't know. Because I'm not the one that created this plan. I'm not the one that set the rules. 
I'm not the one that set the parameters. Don't go beyond this and don't go beyond this to the right or to the left. I've got to walk within the parameters of the straight and narrow to lead me to heaven. But as I walk daily in this particular path, the path of righteousness, it's called in Scripture, it's good for me to kind of look backward and to see what took place in times past. Romans chapter 15 and verse 4, Paul would say, these things that were written aforetime were written for my learning. I can see how God dealt with Noah. I can see how God dealt with the various ones that did not serve him faithfully, were not obedient to him, and how God reacted. I can learn from what that, that has been taking place, the battle that has been that's been going on and the battle that continues even to this day. You see, behind the scenes, God and Satan at war. Oh, we may not see all of the battles. We may not even know some of the things that are taking place. But they're still at war. And we need to understand our role, our position, where we are today and what has taken place in the past. That's my goal tonight. I hope that you have one of the little study books. If you have it in your hand, I need to pause and do some housekeeping. The lessons have been developing over the last several weeks, a few months. I've never presented this series before. This past Wednesday, this idea came up. My wife is still kind of frustrated with me. I do that at times, I'm afraid. But because it's a late thought and something that was just done Wednesday, there's mistakes in it. Turn to page 10. If some of you are familiar with computer jargon, you know what cut and paste is, don't you? Well, cut and paste is a problem. When you paste it and then you don't correct it, that is really the serious problem on page 10, look at the title, God Equal Truth, 100% Evil. Oh, how wrong that is. Mark that out. Change that to truth. Turn the page to page 12. Look up at the top. Satan, our enemy, 100% good. Not true on any level. I'm sorry. That had to be corrected. And breaking the momentum or breaking the thought of study, it was essential that I change that immediately. Let's look at God and Satan. When we look at God, we look at someone who is holy, 100% holy, someone who is faithful. He has always been faithful. There has never been anything that he's promised but what God did. I today can count on God to do exactly what He said that He will do for me. We referred this morning to 2 Peter chapter 1 where Peter spoke about precious and exceeding great promises. The promises that God has made when I do what He says, when I obey the way that He says, He will add me to the church. He told me that. He promised me that. He'll wash away my sins. I can know that to be a fact. When I walk in the light, as He is in the light, the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanseth me from my sin. I know that. I take that to the bank. That's found, by the way, in 1 John 1, verse 7. He goes further in verses 7, 8, and 9, and 10, dovetailing on into chapter 2. He tells us that we have an advocate with the Father. And when we avail ourselves of that, walking in the light, the blood of Jesus Christ cleanseth us, continued to cleanse us, why? Because God is faithful. God is holy. God is good. God is omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent, and eternal. That means God is all-powerful. He's everywhere present, and He knows everything. You see, my mind can't grasp. I cannot put my mind around deity. I think in terms of it, a human. The limitations of a human being. I can only do so much. I can dream it maybe, but I can't perform it. But God, you see, with God, nothing is impossible. All things are possible with God. 
And God has blessed you and me with the promises, with the privilege of being a child of His, with the privilege and the great anticipation and joy of one day living in heaven with Him. Just stop and think about that. Grasp that if you can. The Creator of the world, the Almighty One, the One that knows everything, even the intents of your heart, this very second, how many hairs you have on your head. He knows everything. And He said to you, and He said to me, come and live with me in heaven, in paradise, in the mansion prepared for you, according to John chapter 14, by Jesus' own words. There's never been an offer ever equal to it. And the Lord looked down and saw you 2,000 years after His Son was on earth. But even as His Son was here, saw you and said, you come and live with me. Oh, there's terms that you must meet. There's things that you must do. And it's got to be according to my terms or it will never happen. Now, with all of those things immediately in our minds, let's think in terms of Satan. He was a fallen angel, we can read in Scripture. Evil from the very beginning. Adversary, the roaring lion, the deceiver, the father of lives, even the father of it, John chapter 8 says. I have trouble understanding Satan like I have un trouble understanding God. I'm not putting him on an equal. I'm just saying I cannot understand any thing or being that is so evil that he looks down at this little boy or this little girl and he says, I want them to be in hell, in torment, not just for a little while, but forever with me. Can you imagine? I can't. Satan is described as our adversary. Our Roaring lion walking about, seeking whom he may devour. Years and years ago, LaDonna and I took our girls to the zoo. Various things that we were amazed at. One that especially caused me to tremble a little bit was those roaring lions behind the bars, behind the glass, but they were pacing about. I was over here on this side. They were over there. I knew that pretty well I was protected, but the idea of them pacing back and forth and knowing that if they could get to me, they would, and I'd be a goner. The Scriptures uses that illustration to describe Satan. He's ready to pounce on you. He's ready to devour you, to destroy you, completely obliterate you, Make it where you will have to be eternally in torment. There's the two entities. There's the battleground, as it were. But let's go further. Let's talk about God for a moment. And there are so many passages. Time certainly doesn't allow us to begin to... Look at Isaiah chapter 40. And hear the words, Hast thou not known? Hast thou not heard? that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, he fainteth not, neither is weary. There is no searching of his understanding. He's not like man. There's a limitation to my physical ability, my physical knowledge, what I can do, much more now at 72 than in years past. Oh, I can still think it. I can imagine it. I can dream it. I just can't do it. I love to play racquetball in times past. Man, I can still hit that ball. I can hit that corner. I can keep it where the opponent cannot, in my mind. <laughs> but that's all. God is not like us. God never fainteth. Listen also to Psalm 86 where he says, But thou, O God, O Lord, you're a God full of compassion. You are gracious, you are long-suffering, plenteous in mercy. That's one of the passages, and in truth. It's overflowing, as it were. Your love, your kindness, your compassion, your generosity, and yes, your mercy and truth. In chapter 100, he said, For the Lord is good, His mercy is everlasting, and His truth, 
His truth endureth to all generations. Heaven and earth will pass away. My word will not. Matthew 24, 35. God is a God of compassion, of truth. Jeremiah says, the Lord liveth in truth, in judgment, in righteousness. And the nation shall bless themselves in him, and in him shall they glory. Again, the list could go on and on. But maybe the one that we're most familiar with is where John says, God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. But I believe that it will do well for us to pause just for a moment and go back over what we probably already know. As I mentioned this morning, even a couple of times, Simon Peter said, I'm going to stir you up. It's going to remind you of something that you already have heard before, but that is worthy of repeating. And the same is true here. What has God done for us? He planned our redemption. He unfolded that redemption's plan. It didn't just come to his mind, there it was. But over the passing of time, the bringing, as it were, to us who are so richly blessed to live in this now, the Christian age, to have a Bible that we can hold in our hands, that Old Testament of which Paul said, all Scripture is inspired of God, profitable in so many ways. But I have the Old Testament and the New Law, the New Covenant, the better covenant, according to Hebrews. I have that fact, that revelation of how that He gave His only begotten Son, left heaven, came to earth in the form of a virgin son, as it were. Emmanuel, Prince of Peace, mighty God is He, Isaiah 9 and verse 6. You see, God sent His Son for a purpose to seek and save the lost, to make redemption possible, to reconcile us to God. And He unfolded that plan, the beautiful plan of giving His Son to die on Calvary, to suffer as a common criminal, carrying our sins, not His own, Hebrews chapter 4 says, He was tempted like as we are, yet without sin. And then we are invited to become His children. He gave us the power, the power to choose, the ability to decide. And thankfully, God has been so patient and long-suffering Look at us today. Look at the world in which we live. How evil is just growing and increasing beyond even imagination. We talked about my dad 40, 50, 60 years ago. But just imagine the changes that have take, taken place in the world from then. Dad died in 1980. 38 years ago. Look at the changes that have taken place in 38 years in our world. Who would have imagined that in 30 years' time we would have legalized the possibility of a man marrying a man and a woman marrying a woman? That abortion would have slaughtered 50 million innocent babies legally? And the list and the items could go on and on. But according to 2 Peter chapter 3, the Lord is long-suffering. He goes ahead and says, not willing that any should perish, but that all would come to repentance. God wants us to come to ourselves. In 1 Chronicles 7, if my people who are called by my name will turn and return to me, I'll be their God and they'll be my people. If we'll do right, if we'll leave the evil lifestyle, if we'll purge it out of our life, if we'll do what's right, God will bless us. I'm convinced according to the 
declarations of God's Word that every time in a worship service, such as this morning or tonight, at the end of a sermon and when we stand to sing an invitation song, God is aware of your condition. And it's almost as if He's saying, please come to me. Come to me tonight. Don't put it off anymore. You don't know how much longer you're going to live on this earth. Please make sure that your soul, make your calling and election sure. Make your res reservation, as it were, reserved in heaven for us. That can be, not be defiled, cannot be taken away. It is secure. Our God is long-suffering. That's what He has done. What has God promised? He's promised to adopt us. He's promised to forgive us. In Hebrews chapter 13, we read He's promised never to forsake us or to leave us. We have access even to the very throne room of God. We can pick up our phones today. We can pull our cell phones out of our pockets and punch in a number, and all of a sudden it's busy. Literally, from the standpoint of accessibility to various people, we may not have access. I've called people needing to talk to them right away. Couldn't do it. There's never a time that but what I can call, as it were, figuratively, illustrating it, that I can access the very throne room of God who will listen, who cares about me, who knows my heartaches, who will lift my burdens, who will comfort my soul, who will forgive my sins. That within itself is a phenomenal thing. And He's told us, He's promised us glory in heaven. That's our Father, just a little bit about it. But now let's look at Satan. From the very beginning until this day, our adversary, a liar, when I read through and examine the Bible and what it has to say about Satan, do that sometime. Just accumulate on your own. The ready reference book out in the foyer came about as just kind of a filing system. Never intended originally to be a book. Now it's exceeded over a half million copies that have been printed, not only in English, but in six foreign countries. Missionaries have used them. What a humbling blessing but when I did those things I would just basically go through and on heaven or on hell or on Satan and various other subjects to say what does God say about it, it doesn't matter what I think it doesn't matter what my opinion is what does the Bible say do that with Satan you see the Bible tells me that Jesus in Matthew chapter 7 warned us about him in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. Jesus spoke about how Satan can deceive, connive, lie, I mean destroy the actual facts. It may be this, and Satan comes up and says, no, it, it's this. God says it's white, Satan says, no, it's not, it's red or black. Completely destroying the truth. Jesus said, take heed, be aware. Paul warned, in Acts chapter 20, we can read beginning in verse 28, how he called the Ephesian elders over to Miletus so he could talk to them. He said, take heed unto yourselves and unto the flock of which you are overseers. For there are going to be those that will arise from among you, and they will teach perverse things. They will teach false doctrines. They'll say things that are not true at all. Satan's wielding power and influence. Can I pause just for a moment and say something? Even this morning we talked about how that sometimes we say I have to say things that we need to hear whether it's pleasant or not. I, I'd rather be talking about the love of God. I'd rather be talking about a peaceful and happy and tranquil life. I'd rather be talking about heaven and all the glory and what we can what we'll read about in but if I'm going to present the entirety of what is truth versus error, I've got to rec recognize what Paul and Jesus 
has said about it. Paul said to the church at Corinth that there's Satan and his ministering servants who appear as ministers of righteousness. Think about that. Here we are walking around in life, and here comes someone that's a religious individual to us, and they look holy. They look righteous. They have the appearance of godliness. But Paul says they are Satan's servants. Under what circumstances would that be? When they're teaching a doctrine that's a doctrine and commandment of men, if I use the definition of Jesus in Matthew 7. If they're not teaching the whole counsel of God, Acts chapter 20. If they're not preaching the word according to 2 Timothy chapter 4. You see, I'm even told in Scripture that things are going to get worse. Worse and worse. Now, according to what had existed even at the first century times, and look at what has taken place since that time, and I know that they're going to be teaching damnable heresies, and it's going to be deceivers, and they're going to even ultimately de deny God and Christ. What do I take away from this? Should I not kind of back up and say, okay, I've read a lot of those passages before, but... Man, I need to be careful. I've got to be aware of every step I take, everything that I do, because Satan is maybe everywhere, and he, he, he doesn't have me right now, but he wants me right now, and if I'm not... And I think your assessment would be correct. It's not easy. We can look at the characteristics of Satan. It was some of this material that I reached the point when I said, okay... I don't need you to just flash this up here on a screen. And I certainly couldn't expect you to be able to write it all down. And thus I wanted to put into your hand a written form. Because when I think about he's a wolf in sheep's clothing, a grievous wolf, how that he corrupts the word of God. And he's those of perverse minds and a deceiver and the antichrist. And he's like a dog and an evil worker. Look at the composite of what we are given from God's holy word. Folks, we're talking, whoa, 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 whoa. Somebody said, no, wait a minute now, Paul. I mean, you're talking about a preacher. You're, you're talking about a religious person. And, and I, know, I know good and well that he's got to be sincere and, and honest. And I'm with you on that. I know that there are some very sincere people. And they truly believe what they say. But they, like Saul of Tarsus, Acts chapter 9 and preceding. Saul was wrong. Oh, he said in Acts chapter 23 and verse 1, I've lived in all good conscience. In other words, what I've done, I've believed that I was right, believed that I was serving the Lord, I was acceptable in His sight. But on that light down that came down from heaven on the road to Damascus, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? What will you have me to do, Lord? If faith only would have saved, he would have been saved right there. He acknowledged God, but he didn't. He was told, according to the account that we have in Acts chapter 9, to go on into Damascus, and it shall be told thee what thou must do to be saved. He went, and he did. Not only in Acts in chapter 9 do we have an account of that, but in Acts chapter 22 and also 26, Saul himself is kind of reflecting, telling the story again. And in Acts 22 and verse 16, at one time as he was telling the story, he, was, he, he, he told about someone saying, Saul, Saul, why do you wait? Why are you tarry? Get up and be baptized and wash away your sins. And he did that. Here was a man that was religious, sincere in the nth degree. But he was wrong as water's not wet. He made a complete 180 degree turn. He was a persecutor, a destroyer on the way to Damascus to get even women and children and put them in jail or kill them. And he now is no longer a persecutor, but he's a proclaimer. He's saying, Christ, who is my life, I will glory only in him. I will preach him. In Romans chapter 1 and verse 14, he says, I'm a debtor. 
because I've done all of these things. I was wrong, and by the grace of God, I am what I am today. In verse 15, he says, I'm ready to preach. And he did preach that up and down all of the hillsides and the cities in all of the area. And then in verse 16, he said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. I'm debtor, I'm ready, and I'm not ashamed. But only after he changed. Folks, I have met some people that knew that they were right. But according to what little knowledge that I have of the Word of God, I knew they were wrong. Do I dare just kind of say, okay, I know their sins here and who am I to judge? And I, I'm not going to say anything. Uh, don't want to make an enemy. But I dare take that course of action and one day stand before God and figuratively, if not literally, have that individual standing right beside me and uttering those words of that song that we sometimes sing. You knew me. Day by day, you met me and you, you knew I was astray, but you never mentioned him to me. The Bible tells us about his methods. They make the word of none effect. They appear righteous, but they're not. They pervert the gospel of Christ. They beguile with enticing words. They lie in hypocrisy. They creep in unaware. We're not even aware they're among us and their attitudes and their desires and their, their, their works and what their, their goal is. The Bible tells us Dare we question? What about our attitude? What should it be concerning those who are following Satan? Knowingly or unknowingly. The Bible tells us that I'm to try them. I'm to test them as it were. Just like we might test uh, something that they call gold. And to see if it's 12, 14 carat or more. I have a method by which I can know for sure we have the authority in this great book that we can know for sure. In 1 John chapter 4 and verse 1, we're told, try the Spirit. In 1 Thessalonians 5, we're told to prove all things. Literally, we're told to reject the false teacher. Don't bid God speed to them, to withdraw from them, to rebuke them sharp, sharply, to stop their mouths, to mark them, which means point them out. Because we hate them? No. Because we love them? Because we're trying to embarrass them? No. We're trying to save their soul. Whatever our motive to, should be, it must be that of caring and lovingly trying to help them get to heaven. The battle between truth and error continues. But there are evil things that are taking place today. I'm so thankful for the Willett Church and a reputation of faithfulness, your love for the truth. But sometimes for us to be aware of what Satan is doing, maybe near to us or far away from us, helps us. And there are many that are advocating the fact that instrumental music is acceptable in our worship today. My dad held several debates I've got the recording on about a half a dozen of them. And part of those was on water baptism, Holy Spirit baptism. Part of them was also on instrumental music. Fifty plus years ago, that took place. But at that time, it was the Lord's church opposing what those practices that took place in denominations. Isn't it amazing that today we have those that have outside on the sign church of Christ and they're advocating to do exactly what was opposed 50, 60 years ago from denominations. The Bible tells us to sing and make melody in our heart. The Bible tells us to psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, teaching and admonishing one another. It says nothing about strumming a guitar, playing a piano, blowing a trumpet or whatever it may be. If indeed God authorized that which he didn't, he specified that he wanted that of vocal music. 
If he had just said make music, we could have chosen between vocal or me mechanical. But since he specified the one, he excluded, he eliminated the opportunity of being able to do that with his blessing. What about praise teams and solos and choruses? What about us just having six, eight, or ten, four, five, or whatever it may be that stands up here on the stage on Sunday morning? We all sit out there in the audience and just listen to them. Maybe pick the most beautiful voices that we have and just let that be our singing. Not acceptable. We are told as children of God to sing, to blend our voices together, to teach one another. Not a solo, not a chorus, not a praise team. Is that easy to say? Not at all. Because it may very well be that some even in the audience would have a different opinion. And you may very well be saying, well, that's just your opinion and mine is different and we kind of go ag agree to disagree and go up. Am I seeing the scriptures wrong? Do I need to look at it again? If indeed I do, tell me. If it is a matter in which Satan is trying to pervert our worship, change our acceptable worship, make it where it's not pleasing in God's sight, and thereby he wins, help me to listen. Community churches, women leaders in worship, an attitude of tolerance and compromise, a mentality of do not be negative, do not preach anything from that pulpit that is negative. That's what I was told one time from a church eldership. I said, okay, maybe I have been too much over on one side, so I'll preach expository lessons. I'll, I'll just take the scripture for what it is and read it. And 30 days later, I was told again, I, we told you nothing negative. My response at that time was, you can't even read the words of Christ and do what you're telling me that you want done. The mentality of there are good people in all religion. I know there are good people. Cornelius was a great person. Saul, no doubt, was a, I mean, a magnificent spiritual individual who was sincere and honest and good. And then some that just say, oh, you're being judgmental. Don't you know it says judge not? Read a little bit further in that Matthew 7 passage, chapter. Go over to John chapter 8 where it says that we're to judge righteous judgment. You'll see that how that's applied is not true. Can't be done. How can I try the spirits? How can I prove all things without assessing or being judgmental of what is being done versus what the Bible says? These are only just a few of many of the things that may be taking place in our world near or far that Satan battling against God. God still has authority. God still has spoken, Hebrews chapter 1. God still is true. God still is righteous. I must follow the will of God. But let me summarize in conclusion. By the way, you know what it means when a preacher says in conclusion? It means absolutely nothing. Sometimes. Here's the final thoughts. This battle is raging. Truth versus error. But we can be victorious. We are told in James 4 to resist the devil and he will flee from thee. In Ephesians 6, we're told to put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil and having done all to stand. In 1 Peter 5, we're to be sober and vigilant because oh, your adversary, the devil, I know walks about, but we can be sober, we can be vigilant, we can oppose him and be victorious. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, Paul says, there will not be a temptation take you, but what? There will be a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. I've got to go looking for it. I, he's not going to just come and take me and say, there's your way. I've got to seek to do righteousness. I've got to seek the truth. I've got to walk in the truth. But God has said I can do it. I've got to make sure and do it. Let's look at a parallel comparison. When we talk about Almighty God, 
In Romans chapter 11, verse 22, we have a powerful passage. Paul said, Behold, therefore, the goodness and the severity of God. To those that do good, goodness. To those that live righteous, God's going to bless you. To those that are evil, that do not do that which is the will of God, there's going to be severity. He will punish you. That's the consequences. And we can see it illustrated with Adam and Eve. Noah and his family. The Israelites. Nadab and Abihu. The incident of the fiery serpents. And ultimately in judgment. In each of those cases, if we had time, we could elaborate concerning how God blessed them. Noah lived in a, a sinful situation. I mean, all the world around him, but you see, Noah was righteous. And Noah, having been warned of God of things not seen, has yet moved with fear and built an ark. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 7. The goodness of God, but the severity toward those... That <clears throat> who lived in evil, who were rebellious against God. The final slide tonight is what man has drawn. I don't know what hell looks like. I do not know what heaven looks like. I haven't seen either. But the caption is pretty penetrating. Whom do we serve? What's our final destiny? When we draw our last breath upon this earth, Matthew 25 and verse 46 says, these, talking about those that did not attend to the Lord's needs, he was in prison, they didn't visit him, he, he was naked and he didn't have clothes, and he was hungry. And it, it, I know that they said, Lord, when do we do... But then he turned it around and spoke about those that did those things. And to those two categories of people, he said, one shall go into everlasting life and the other into eternal torment. Our eternal destiny is determined by how we live not just kind of how we look at ourselves and say, man, everything's just great. But how God sees us, not how man sees us. I want to ask you simply, are you right in the sight of God this very moment? If there's anything that you need to do to change that indeed that your life would be, as it were, pleasing to God as you stood before Him in final judgment and He's about to pronounce sentence. Depart from me, you worker of iniquity. Enter into the mansion, you servant of righteousness. The goats from the sheep, the parting of the two. Many there be that go in thereat, few there be that find it. It's a reality. It's not just a figment of some preacher's imagination. It is a matter in which you're going to give an account one day before God, and God has the power then to say, depart, torment, eternally. We must make sure that we do anything to pay whatever cost, to give up whatever we've got to give up, to live however we've got to live, to conform to the precepts and the commands and the statutes of God, to hear Him say, well done, faithful servant. But on the flip side of that, I've got to make sure that I do anything and everything, pay any cost that I must, to avoid torment. In Luke's account of the gospel record, we read about the rich man and Lazarus, and the rich man fared sumptuously every day. 
Lazarus, he, he just begged for the crumbs that fell off of the table, and he didn't have the strength to even knock the dogs that licked his sores. It says in Scripture that Lazarus died and was carried into Father Abraham's bosom by angels. What a beautiful thought. It just says the rich man died. And in torment, in hell, in a lake of fire, unquenchable fire, he opened his eyes. He didn't ask for much. Would you send Lazarus? Let him dip his finger in water and, and touch it in my tongue. I am tormented in this flame. I believe that all that we have in Scripture that speaks about hell and the eternality of it is there for a purpose of scaring us. Oh, not just emotions only. Not just from the standpoint of, I want that. Oh, I don't want that. I'll do what. But by the love and the grace and the mercy of God, those that are rebellious will have that eternally. But we don't have to. It's not prepared for you. The Bible says it's prepared for the devil and his angels. Is that you? Don't let it be changed tonight. If there's anything that we can do tonight, one of the elders will be here at the front. He'll gladly take your hand. He'll, he'll do whatever he can to help you get to heaven. If you need to come to him, please come as we stand and as we sing.